Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the front row. My name is Jamie Williamson. I'm the executive vice president here at Scripps Research. And today we, we're in for a real treat. Our speaker today is, of course, Jay Pandit. Uh, I, I wanted to say a few things before I formally introduce Jay. So, so one, one of the things uh, I wanted everyone to be aware of is that Scripps really spans an awful lot of uh, diverse approaches to medicine. One is basic science, uh, and another is drug discovery. And then uh, the topic of today's lecture is another area that we cover, which is translational science. So how do we actually use uh, scientific uh, in inquiry to uh, create new treatments. Uh, so the, the center of much of that work at Scripps is the Scripps Research Translational Institute. And this is, of course, led by, by Eric Topol. And uh, if you haven't encountered him on social media, I suggest that you follow him. He's always got a lot of interesting uh, perspectives and, and really, really great at distilling current medical information. Uh, but the SRTI was founded to harness the availability of genomic information. And, and this is expanding now uh, into uh, individualized medicine and in part through uh, personal digital devices. Uh, so the digital medicine vision was founded uh, at SRTI, and we're really pleased to bring on Jay Pandit full-time here at Scripps as the director of digital medicine. And the goal is to really make uh, devices and wearables and personal information uh, accessible to, to people in, on a range of technologies. Uh, you're going to hear uh, a bunch of these things, and you'll have the opportunity to even sign up for them. But there's here's a couple of examples of programs that have been developed at SRTI. Uh, My Gene Rank and uh, Detect, uh, which was uh, a, a way to monitor physiology for uh, the presence of a viral infection, and a really popular program is Power Mom. And we had a we had a front row about Power Mom not, not that long ago. Uh, now, the last thing I, I want to remind everyone is that, that we are a research institute. We're not a medical institute. And so uh, we really can't provide you with individualized advice about treatment. Uh, we're not a physician. Uh, Jay, Jay's a physician, uh, but, but we can't really do that in the, in the context of the front row. So uh, please don't uh, ask us any uh, questions that relate to your personal medical history. Okay, so today... Uh, the, the subject is how to use personal uh, digital devices. So I think everybody's got, I mean, look, everybody's got one of these. I got a, I got a, this is a Garmin. So it monitors my heart rate. So probably most people have tried these. Uh, and I would have to say that these devices have really been disruptive to the, the practice of medicine in, in, a, in a positive way. Uh, you know, if you think about going to going to see the doctor, you're sick, and you know what are, what are the things they look at? Your vital signs. You know, you go for the heart heart rate, the temperature, the blood pressure, and then from there you go off into treatment. And and what Jay is going to tell us about today is now you can access all of this information on your person with a personal device. And so Jay is going to update us about the current state and then take a look ahead uh, at what might be coming down the road. So uh, it's my real pleasure to introduce Jay. And, and so people can ask questions by typing into the Q&A or chat. Uh, I will come back on uh, at the end of Jay's presentation and we'll, I'll moderate the questions and we'll have a little Q&A. So uh, without further ado, uh, Jay, uh, welcome to Front Row and looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Jamie, for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you everyone uh, for taking the time today uh, and for your time and attention. Today's talk is a uh, combination of my clinical research and personal journeys that have converged into a career in digital medicine. I will be pulling us a little bit away from the bench and closer to the bedside. Now, I was born in a small community hospital in India where my mother did not have access to prenatal care and then raised in Kenya where I got measles, mumps, chicken pox, and malaria multiple times before I had access to the vaccinations. 
And then in the United States, uh, my educational training took me through Stanford uh, University of California in San Francisco, and then ultimately at Northwestern University, where I trained to become a cardiologist who then was diagnosed with a brain tumor or brain cancer at the age of 32. So suffice it to say, I come to this talk um, with a unique view on how humans interact with different healthcare systems from both sides of the curtain. So where do vital signs fit in this picture? Vitals are considered the universal screener for illness whether at home or in the clinic, it is usually the first point of contact between an individual and their physiology. And in my opinion, the field of digital medicine was born when we were truly able to democratize the measurement of a vital sign, in this case, heart rate. And by the end of this talk, I hope to give you to provide a basic understanding of the four original vitals and how work by our group and our collaborators are expanding the way we see them. So here's the roadmap. I will start off with the four original vitals, temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. Provide a quick physiology primer on each one, discuss the evolution of measurement devices, and then present informational cases to demonstrate how things are changing. The reason I have chosen this lens of vital signs is to highlight the translational science and engineering required for them to be universally recognizable and accessible today. Anyone can walk down the street to, st to a store and get a simple device to measure temperature and blood pressure. We want to peel the layers back and look at the translational science behind this. And in the, in the world of digital medicine, with the widespread use of wearables, we now have oceans of vital sign data just waiting to be made clinically relevant. So let's start with the first one. Temperature, recognized as far back as the first century as one of the four cardinal signs of acute inflammation, color, heat. The other three are dolor, pain, rubor, redness, tumor, swelling. Today, excuse me, today it is universally accepted that the normal human body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees centigrade. And a fever is considered anything above 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So what, what causes a fever? In a grossly oversimplified manner, this is how it happens. When my son brings back a pathogen from his school, it enters my system through my nose or throat, represented here, by the box containing infections. <clears throat> and then it encounters the first line of defense of my immune system represented here by the monocytes. Once, and these monocytes then release small functional peptides called cytokines that enter the circulation and make their way to the, to the brain, specifically to a part of the brain that's the thermostat of the brain called the hypothalamus. When they encounter the cells of the hypothalamus, they cause the release of a small chemical called prost uh, prostaglandin E2, which ultimately causes the release of a neurotransmitter. So from cytokines to prostaglandins to neurotransmitters, the ultimate message is for the hypothalamus to elevate its temperature set point. It achieves this by sending neurologic signals to the blood vessels in my arms, in my legs to constrict, to reduce heat loss, and then tells tells my gut to ramp up metabolic heat production until the blood bathing the hypothalamus reaches that elevated set point. Again, I, I apologize to the immunologist viewing this uh, for my over, oversimplification, but all this beautiful physiology gets boiled down to one number in degrees Fahrenheit or degrees centigrade. So let's talk about the devices that provide us with this number. While the history of thermometry goes all the way back to the times of Galileo, I'm going to focus on the first practical medical thermometers, which were introduced in the late 1800s and were focused on the concept of liquid expansion. In this particular case, mercury. Mercury is the only metal that is in liquid form at room temperature and therefore has a high, co a high coefficient of expansion, meaning with any small temperature changes, it significantly uh, it, it, it's contracts and expands significantly such that when it's put in a thin glass tube and the temperature of it changes, you can visibly see it move or contract. And for the next century, most thermometers were based on this concept of liquid expansion. The liquid may have changed from alcohol, mercury, to gallium until the 1960s when the ear thermometer was introduced. 
The ear thermometer was introduced by Dr. Theodore Benziger in 1964 because he wanted to measure the temperature of the hypothalamus, the thermostat of the brain, and realized that the eardrum and the hypothalamus shared, shared the same blood supply. So measuring the temperature of the eardrum would provide the closest prox approximation to the temperature of the hy hypothalamus. And over the next 20 years, we went from analog measurements to digital measurements, from contact measurements, where you had to touch the, the surface for which we wanted to get the temperature, to non-contact measurements, which were brought about by the introduction of infrared thermometers, the first patents for which were filed in 1980. Um, these, and I bet everybody who is listening to this lecture has had their forehead temperature measured at some point in the last three years to either enter a building or enter an event. With widespread temperature monitoring came the ability to trend and track these temperatures. And with the miniature, with now with the miniaturization of sensors, of temperature sensors really, we have the ability to continuously track the temperatures with sensors as small and flexible as tattoos. This is work, this work is uh, that I'm highlighting in the, on the far right of the screen is, is from our collaborator, Dr. John Rogers at Northwestern. But the point here is we now can measure and trend your temperature and that of others frequently and even continuously anytime and anywhere. So why is this useful to someone? Let me demonstrate this through an informational case. This is Jane. She has a history of asthma, a lung condition. She lives in New York City and like many of us has been considering going back to work in person. Given that she has a lung condition, she wants to know her risk of going back to work and, contr and contracting a viral illness. When she goes to a provider and asks this question and her clinic, and her clinic temperature is normal, the provider with this snapshot would really just focus on preventive measures like vaccinations, masking when indoors if, if possible, um, and uh, washing their hands, basic hygiene. But with remote temperature monitoring, we can do a lot more. We can develop fever maps like this one from New York City, uh, from the Kinsa's, Kinsa, from the company Kinsa's health weather app. This way, Jane can identify fever clusters down to her neighborhood and plan the safest route to work. Remote temperature monitoring has the potential to be an early indicator of outbreaks. It has also demonstrated utility in therapy monitoring, like in chemotherapy, to identify neutropenic fevers, and, and even in non-infectious disease scenarios like fertility monitoring. So temperature has gone from being an individual fever screener to a supplemental population, to possibly a supplemental population health tool, a therapy monitoring tool, and a fertility aid. The field is active, and a lot of groups like ours are working hard to answer these questions about associations to other clinical syndromes. So that is the first vital sign. We have three more to go, so let's move on to the second one. Heart rate the most commonly measured vital sign with wearables. And the widely accepted range for our heart rate is uh, 60 to 100 beats per minute. Now, heart rate control is, is, is a complicated scenario. So it's controlled by many different variables, but I'm gonna focus on four. The most powerful one in the dotted box is the, uh, is the nervous system, specifically the autonomic nervous system. The system that allows me to raise my heart rate, increase blood flow to my muscles so that I can fight or run away from a lion chasing me, which is our fight or flight response or the sympathetic nervous system. The opposite of that fight or flight response system is the rest and digest system that slows things down so that I can absorb nutrients and be ready for the next time I have to run away. The second one is the chemoreceptor system, basically the system that detects the end products of metabolism shown here uh, in, in the purple and products of metabolism like carbon dioxide. You can imagine if, that, if the levels of carbon dioxide are high in the blood, we want the heart to send more blood to the lungs to exchange that carbon dioxide for oxygen. The third is the baroreceptor system. This looks at how much blood pressure exists within the closed vascular system, the pipes of the cardiovascular system. Um, and if the blood vessel, if the, if the pressures are high, it sends signals to the heart to reduce the amount of cardiac output with each beat. And the major components of the cardiac output are heart rate and stroke volume. Stroke volume is basically the amount of blood that goes into the heart that, that uh, with each contraction is pumped out. And finally, the endocrine or the hormone system. Hormones like, an, an example of which is epinephrine, which is released by a gland sitting on top of your kidneys called the adrenal gland. And we all know what epinephrine can do to our heart rates. Now I'm grossly neglecting the intrinsic electrical conduction system of the heart itself, 
which is very hard for me to do as a cardiologist. But again, this complex interplay gets boiled down to one number of beats per minute. So let's talk about the devices. The most common approach to measuring heart rate is feeling the pulse at the wrist and measuring it over a minute. Now, the, the, the concept of a pulse was recognized as far back as the beginnings of the Roman Empire. But the reason I've put down 1707 here is that is when the pocket watch entered the scene and allowed us to get a rate. Then we went from sensing the pulse to visualizing it when the field of electrocardiography was born in late 1800s. Electrocardiography measures the electrical signals of the heart itself. From sensing to visualizing, but it was not until photoplethysmography was introduced in the 1930s that we were able to develop personal devices. Now, photoplethysmography is a mouthful, so, and uh, the abbreviation for it is PPG, so I'm going to use PPG going forward. But PPG is the use of emitted light and measuring its reflection or transmission to deduce a measurement. When you shine a light, when we shine a spectrum of light on our fingertips, we can use the reflection or transmission of the light to deduce blood volume changes at the fingertip tips, as well as blood oxygen levels at the fingertips, as shown in this particular picture. And lastly, when these PPG sensors were miniaturized, we were finally able to move heart rate measurements to the wrist. So to summarize this, we went from sensing to visualizing to personalizing and now democratizing heart rate measurements. Again, why does this matter? Remember Jane, she avoided fever clusters, but did not want to miss her best friend's wedding. And unfortunately, tested positive for COVID two months ago. Now she is back to her baseline, does not have a cough, fever, or any other symptoms, but is wondering why her heart rate remains elevated. Her heart rate in the clinic is 80 beats per minute, and she has a normal temperature. And with this specific snapshot, a provider may develop a large differential, but remote heart rate monitoring can help stratify that differential. As our group showed in the DETECT study of wearable signals in COVID, your resting heart rate here, if you look at the, at the graph, at, at the, oops, sorry about that. If you look at the graph and the red line on the graph, your resting heart rate after an acute COVID infection remains elevated and can remain elevated for up to 90 days post-infection before it comes down to baseline. The DETECT study was launched in February 2020 with the purpose, and the purpose of it was to understand more about the novel coronavirus. This was right before the shutdown in March 2020. And in 72 days, close to 35,000 individuals downloaded the DETECT app, the DETECT study app, and consented to share their wearable data and fill out surveys, as well as their uh, electronic health record data. And many seminal publications came out of this particular cohort, including granular biometrics of infections, vaccinations, and even the very first signals of long COVID, supporting the use of wearables as a supplementary tool in outbreak surveillance. And a nod to this, is the CDC's announcement yesterday in the Washington Post of the Center for Forecasting and Outbreak Analytics, basically trying to improve our and inform our pandemic response for the next pandemic. Now, getting back to heart rate, the resting heart rate is just one digital biomarker of heart rate. Another interesting digital biomarker of heart rate is heart rate variability. Now, heart rate variability, which is well, which is well known in the world of cardiology and athletic performance, it is the time difference between each beat averaged over a day. And interestingly, now that we have longitudinal personal data, it has shown promise as a marker for infection, for sleep health, and mental health. Take, for example, this one year period of monitoring that you see with the graph. Um, and this is a period of one year period of monitoring of heart rate variability in an athlete training for the Ironman. You can see how the heart rate variability changes when he is sick right here. So he, he had a bicycle accident and his heart rate variability went down. I mean, assuming that he's, he wasn't able to cycle or, or, or train for, for that time period. With high altitude training is high, his heart rate variability went up. With increased stress, his heart rate variability goes down. He does his Ironman and then after that gets sick and the heart rate variability significantly goes down. So over time, yeah. and, and, our, and our group, our group is actively analyzing heart rate variability in all our cohorts. 
And since heart rate is the most commonly collected vital sign, there are multiple other granular characteristics of heart rate being investigated, such as heart rate recovery, rate of rise, and the whole world of ambulatory cardiology, uh, ambulatory, ambulatory electrocardiography, which adds the dimension of heart rhythm to heart rate, opening up a new layer of biomarkers, which I will have to say for another day. I will stop on heart rate here because we have two more vital signs to go. Hopefully I'm giving you a flavor of the potential of longitudinal vital sign monitoring. Let's move on to the next one. Respiratory rate. This is the amount of breaths we take in a minute. And the normal for which in their normal physiology is 12 to 16 breaths per minute. Now this one's a little quick and simple uh, and a little bit simpler than the other ones to understand and is largely controlled by pH receptors or chemoreceptors, which look at the amount of carbon dioxide in our blood. If we focus on the, on the red arrow, when carbon dioxide levels are sensed as high, pH, which carbon dioxide and pH are interrelated and pH is low, the cardiorespiratory center in the brain, in the brain stem specifically, is told to increase or ramp up the respiratory rate so that we can exchange that carbon dioxide for oxygen. And it achieves this by telling the diaphragm to contract, to contract faster. When the diaphragm on the, uh, as shown below the lungs, is told to contract, it moves downwards. As it moves downwards, it expands the volume of the thorax, generating a negative pressure in the lungs so that when you open your mouth and a breath of air, uh, sorry, air moves in and creates a breath. And that's how we get our respiratory rate. The most common way or the most common approach to, to get respiratory rate measurements is using our senses, either listening to the heart, to the breath sounds, or observing the chest expand over a minute. But now with sensors, we can quantify what the senses were doing. Accelerometers can quantify chest movement over a period of time, continually, while acoustic sensors can listen for breath sounds. So again, why does this matter? Well. Jane is now six months post her COVID infection and is getting short of breath again. She doesn't have a fever, any other signs of infection, but knows that not everyone presents the same way with a viral infection. And she's wondering if this is COVID, asthma, or something else. Her respiratory rate is at the upper limits of normal. With this snapshot, a provider may have a very large differential may want to go down the pathway of getting an x-ray or a COVID test or all of them, but acoustic sensors can help. Studies have now shown that acoustic sensors can indeed pick up a packet of sound and stratify that sound into talking, coughing, snoring, breathing. And the next step is identifying ac acoustic signatures for various cardiorespiratory conditions, including pneumonia, asthma. Imagine, if Jane had an acoustic sensor that told her to save her COVID test because this is her asthma acting up. We are actively investigating this ability to develop cardiorespiratory acoustic signatures in, our, in a sub-study of our de detect cohort. Acoustic signaling has also demonstrated utility in heart valve disorders, sleep disorders, as well as mental health disorders. Now that's all for respiration. I'm going to move on to the fourth vital sign. Blood pressure, the final frontier for vital sign monitoring by wearables to make their mark in clinical diagnostics. It is my favorite vital, not just because I'm a cardiologist who loves hemodynamics, but it is where my journey in translational science and design thinking began. Blood pressure in normal physiology tells us about the health of the heart and the vascular system. Now, most of the vital signs have just one number. Why does blood pressure have two? This figure gives a good explanation. We'll start at the very top. At the very top, when the heart has received blood from the lungs and it's full and ready to send that blood to the body, the heart, which is a muscle, remember, the walls of the heart have to generate a pressure, a pressure to overcome the valve that keeps that blood inside the heart. That pressure that is generated by the walls of the heart to push open up the doorway to the vascular bed is a major contributor to the systolic or the upper, the upper number. Once the blood has been ejected into the vascular system, 
pressure starts going down. As the pressure starts going down, the valve shuts and there's an, a column of blood within the vascular system. And the walls of the vascular system themselves have a tonality to them. They have layers. One, uh, one of the layers is actually uh, a muscular layer. And that muscular layer puts re a resistance or a pressure on the column of blood. And that is the major component of the lower pressure, the, the lower number, the diastolic pressure, giving us 120 over 80, a number that most people recognize. Another interesting thing about blood pressure is that it is the only vital sign that directly translates into a medical condition, high blood pressure or hypertension, a condition that affects over 1 billion adults globally is the primary modifiable risk factor for strokes, heart attacks, and chronic kidney diseases. It is the second most common reason for clinic visits. And for those who are diagnosed with it, more, close to half remain uncontrolled. And one of the major reasons for this is the method of measurement. Now, I'm sure all of us have had our blood pressure measured at some point or another, and many may have questioned those numbers. In fact, studies have shown that one in five patients in clinic have a falsely elevated blood pressure. The approach of cuff-based blood pressure monitoring, putting a cuff around the arm, compressing it to get a, bl a blood pressure, was introduced in 1896 by Scipione Riverrochi, who used rubber tubing. This is the top, uh, the top left on my screen, uh, uh, black and white picture, where there's a rubber tubing from a bicycle. He used that to compress the arm in the in a mercury manometer to measure the pressure to see how much pressure was required to make the pulse go away. And now, almost 125 years later, it still continues to remain the most common method of measurement. And in 2015, in 2015, when I looked into this space, the only other tool for measurement was these home-based blood pressure monitors or an ambulatory blood pressure monitor, which you can, which you can see down at the bottom right. An ambulatory blood pressure monitor is a cuff connected to a hip-based pump. That pump inflates the cuff every 15 minutes, compressing your arm for 24 to 48 hours. <clears throat> I could tell you that for any patient that I prescribed this device to, they came back and said, I will never do that again. There was a dire need at the time in 2015 for a better method of measurement. And there was no true wearable cuffless device available. Now, there had been many attempts but the most successful ones were only able to bring the cuff from the arm down to the finger. Other approaches had tried to put a tonometer or a pressure sensor compressing continuously against the artery of your wrist, which you can imagine is not that comfortable. But the most activity was in the optical sensor space because everyone wanted to incorporate blood pressure into the wrist wearable. The optical, or in other words, which is the same as the PPG sensor, recreated the pulse waveform using blood volume changes that were seen in the light reflected by light emitting diodes. Basically, looking at light shining on the fingertips and the amount of light that's reflected back or transmitted back, we could recreate the pulse waveform. And most landed on this concept of pulse wave velocity, the speed of the pulse waveform. The thought was that if we could find the distance of travel for the pulse wave once it comes out of the heart, and reaches and re, uh, once it comes out of the heart, and also find the amount of time it takes for that pulse to travel from the heart to the periphery where we can measure it using a PPG sensor, then we could get pulse wave velocity. And there had been some published equations from the field of fluid dynamics with assumptions that in the field from the field of fluid dynamics that converted that velocity to a pressure. So simply speaking, you know, most people said, okay, we're, there's not, there's not going to be a way that we can truly measure the, the vascular distance of travel. And so most groups just decided to use a constant, many using half the height. So attention was paid more on the time. And there was a way for us to actually get that time. If a PPG sensor could create a pulse waveform and an electrocardiogram could create a heartbeat waveform, then if we overlap them and measure the time between the EKG and the PPG, we could get the time of travel for the pulse. That was known as pulse transit time. And But despite a reasonable hypothesis, lots of companies and venture dollars failed 
because of a couple issues in the approach. One was all the assumptions, the assumptions about distance traveled, um, as well as assumptions in those conversion equations that took velocity and took it back to pressure. Those equations assumed that blood vessels were perfectly elastic, and that is just not the case. The second is the electrical signal of the heart. Just like when we touch, when we turn on a light switch, the current, the circuit is complete, the current has to travel to the light bulb, heat the coil until light emanates. After the electrical circuit hits the heart, the heart cells, the myocardial cells have to be prepared and physically contract. And there is an electromechanical delay in time. And that delay was called pre-ejection period. And it was found that that pre-ejection period could be up to 70% of pulse transit time. And so in 2015, my team and I asked ourselves, are there two parts of the body that are subjected to the same physiology rules and the same pre-ejection period, but different enough temporally such that we could measure that difference and we landed on the two upper extremities. Both arms are subjected to the same physiology rules in the same pre-ejection period because they're both supplied by the same heart sending blood to, uh, to, the, to the sources of blood supply. Yet, when a packet of blood, a packet of blood is ejected from the heart, it enters, as you can see here, ejected from the heart, it enters the bloodstream and blood is first sent down to the right arm through the right brachiocephalic artery before the left arm uh, through the left subclavian artery. And that was our theory. To sum this up, we asked the question, does the right pulse arrive before the left pulse? And after theorizing it, we built a rudimentary pro prototype and measured and found that yes, assuming normal physiology, in most people, in most people, there was, about, there was about a 15 to 20 millisecond difference. Now we wanted to change blood pressure and we asked participants to dunk their feet in 40 degree water which you can imagine raise their blood pressures. But we saw that our differential pulse arrival time tracked those changes in blood pressure. We also asked a participant to wear the rudimentary wired prototype overnight and we could track their sleep and wake cycles. Compressing years of work, we ultimately came down to this development prototype, which measures optical sim signals at the two thumbs to give a blood pressure. And give it a second so you can see, there we go. Now, this prototype is still in development, but there is a commercially available wearable today for the wrist with CE mark approval from a Swedish company called Actia that does measure and give you cuffless wearable blood pressures. What was thought of as a moonshot just a decade ago is now reality. And the reason it became reality is that there was finally an alignment of the technology push and the clinical pull. In 2015, there were, there were a set of trials that came out that suggested that we need to intensively control, that there's a mortality benefit by intensively controlling blood pressure to lower targets. Then acknowledging these trials, the guideline bodies came out and lowered the threshold for becoming for, for diagnosing hypertension. Before everybody thought that an abnormal blood pressure or high blood pressure was above 140 over 90 before 2017, after 2017, it was 130 over 80. Doing this added 30 million more Americans into the category of chronic hypertension. And recognizing the limitation of the tools for better blood pressure monitoring, in 2019, the guideline bodies came out and said, okay, we understand that we need better tools. We're going to relax some of the reimbursement requirements for more blood pressure monitoring, facilitating innovation and interest by device developers until we had better tools. That device on, on the right side at the very end of this, uh, of this timeline is the Actia wearable device. Now that was our last vital sign. I've spoken about each vital sign separately, but they are interdependent and usually measured together. And the ability to measure all of them remotely gave rise to the field of remote patient monitoring. And the reason I brought up 
the alignment of the technology push and the, and the clinic pull is I see this happening now in the field of RPM, in the field of remote patient monitoring. The pandemic has normalized virtual care delivery. Regulatory bodies are updating their device approval processes and reimbursement bodies are creating new codes for remote patient monitoring. However, the most common method of remote monitoring still is for the individual to take their own vital signs with rudimentary devices or even with their wearables and report them to the provider. Device manufacturers are focused on ingesting, device manufacturers right now are focused on ingesting these vital signs and data, but struggle with how to present it to the provider to make it clinically actionable. So my initial studies, or uh, so I initially developed remote monitoring studies, but in the inpatient setting to answer this question. This is from an active study that I have with my collaborators on how best to ingest this data and present it to providers. Here, focusing just on this side, not only do we have vital science data, we also have the ability to, to overlay ECG data, uh, PPG data, seismocardiography data, raw signals, time, time stamp all of them, and ultimately figure out how to best put all this data together and analyze it. But the bigger question was how to scale this to the ambulatory setting so that it's useful for everybody. Because now, as sensor capabilities continue to expand, we have the ability to finally recreate the physiologic milieu of an individual in their home setting longitudinally, making this whole concept of a digital twin more possible and truly moving medicine from being reactive to proactive. Sensors these days don't just measure heart rate, steps, distance, calories, they can measure things all the way down to hormone levels, calorie intake, blood alcohol levels, how much UV light is being exposed, how much UV light uh, the skin has been expo exposed to. The field is poised to make some amazing discoveries, but there are challenges for all stakeholders involved, like patients concern around data privacy and security, how to present these data streams to providers, how to develop the clinic infrastructure to accept this data, how insurance companies should pay for this for the time used to review this data, for wearable manufacturers to address, um, to, to balance the need to keep things proprietary, but promoting open science for validation, for pharmaceutical companies to incorporate digital biomarkers as, as acceptable outcomes, for research group like, groups like ours to make sure that the digital divide does not become another source of health inequity, for regulatory bodies to to provide guide, guidance on standardization, just to name a few. But the good thing is none of these are insurmountable. We at Scripps, along with our industry partners and collaborators are actively working on these challenges. Our five actively centralized studies that are, that are enrolling right now, you can jump on the, the, the websites are right there, um, in the fields of infectious disease, maternal health, which Jamie mentioned, it's Power Mom, um, our progress study in the field of precision nutrition, our refresh study in the field of sleep um, and the All of Us research, research, the National All of Us research, research Program are taking in data streams of biometrics, not just biometrics, not just vital signs, but as well as genetics and electronic health record data to integrate, working on integrating, standardizing, and analyzing these multimodal data sets, and ultimately with the hope of providing real-time feedback. Imagine if Jane, before having any symptoms, could be told by her wearable that her vitals have changed. So have her activity levels. Allergen levels in the environment are high. And many other people have presented with asthma flares. Maybe she should consider keeping a rescue inhaler nearby. The future is bright for digital biomarkers and digital medicine. And here's a taste of where we are headed enhancing the power of vital signs by adding biofluid analytes like sweat, saliva, and blood, expanding data streams to ingest not just static data like snapshots of heart rates, but also episodic data and continuous data, learning how to customize digital engagement across class spectrums, across races, across technical infrastructure spectrums, moving from collectively, uh, moving from collecting data actively to passively, like when you were asleep, moving from post-processing to real time so that we can actually provide actionable information, 
maybe we can finally realize the dream of a virtual personal medical assistant. Now, we've covered a lot of ground today. And if you walk away from this talk with one message, it is that digital medicine is here to stay. And that making biomarkers, digital biomarkers clinically relevant is a critical step in making medicine proactive rather than reactive. To round things out, I have one last case, mine. I'm a 38 year old cardiologist with a history of brain cancer who had surgery, chemotherapy and radiation. I get MRIs every three to four months for screening because not enough data, uh, there's not enough data on risk factors for tumor recurrence. In fact, the only thing that my providers could tell me after my diagnosis for certain was that brain tumors always come back. We just don't know when it'll happen. Maybe precision health enabled by digital health technology with large longitudinal data sets might hold this answer. This is my calling. So all the work presented in this talk today would not be possible without all the support from my colleagues, mentors, teachers, and friends throughout my professional journey, and especially now here at Scripps. I will end with a quote that I really like. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Now I'll hand it back to Jamie to introduce the next lecture, and we can take any questions. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. That was terrific. Uh, we got a lot of questions, but I, let me just remind everyone the next front row is going to be Mike, Mike Ballong on the 29th of June, talking about regenerative medicine. So this is one of our young up and coming stars. And uh, we invite you to sign up for that lecture. Now let's, let's but let's come back to Jay. Uh, so Jay, I found myself uh, thinking, so, so I was a Trekkie and, and I've actually got uh, a communicator. <laughs> And, and so, so I'm, I'm thinking tricorder is next. And, and it's, it's really remarkable. We're, you know, we're, we're getting there mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of being able to monitor a lot of uh, information. So, so one, one of the things, I mean, there, so there's a lot of data that, that comes with this. And then it, it, there's just a bunch of questions that come to mind and people have touched on this and I'll just generalize it. So, so what do you do with this information? So you're getting this. And, and there seems like there's two kinds of general questions you could ask. So one is, how do my data compare to the general population? And then, and then how do my data today compare to me uh, mm -hmm. as, 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 a, as a norm? And then where's the data go? So, you know, I have it. It goes to the cloud. Does the vendor get it? Uh, are you giving it to your provider? And, and how is all that regulated? So, so may, you know, maybe say a little bit more about the information and how we can use it and how is it actionable and what's, what are the privacy issues? Oh, absolutely. And it is, it is one of the major concerns right, right now. But that data does initially go to the device manufacturers, right? And we have taken steps towards creating data governance bodies that actually regulate the, the use of this particular data. And there are clinical trials that are actually actively like one called Heartline or HeartShare that's trying, that's, that's collecting all this data from different institutions and, and de-identifying it and ultimately sharing it, putting in one body that has a data governance structure placed over it. Yes, there's work to be done for people to finally believe that this they, that they can trust sending their data out. The, to, to answer your second question, there the, the approach is, and you're absolutely right, everybody's blood pressure, everybody's heart rate changes differently in different settings. And so we cannot just simply say, oh, a generalizable algorithm for blood pressure derivation will apply to everybody. But we're finally at this, uh, we, re we recognize this problem. And, and the, the goal is not to find variations um, compared to everyone. The goal is to find variations compared to you. And that's where we are. We are at, at that initial starting point is renormalization, uh, getting, getting back to that. Uh, variation from you and what that means for your health. But when we get, when we do this enough with enough, enough of a, of a large data set, we can actually start seeing trends. And I think that's where we're headed. Uh, the, you know, the goal uh, over, over time would not be to just treat to a target. The goal over time is to treat the pattern, the risk factors. So, right. I mean, it strikes me there's parallels with use of genomic information. I mean, it's, it's in everyone's interest to share all the information. So we see the, you know, all the genes that are out there or all of the wearable data that's out there 
but at the same time, you have privacy concerns that your individual data wouldn't be used for, you know, against you in some way or by mm -hmm. others for profit. So it, it's an interesting time we live in, but I, I think you've made a pretty clear case that we need to sort of share this data for, for, the, for the greater good. Mm -hmm. So one, uh, someone asked a question that I found pretty interesting. What about oxygen levels? And, and in particular, in, in light of COVID and, uh, you know, the, the challenges for oxygenation when, with more acute infections. Is, is that a, something that's uh, where there, is there an app for that yet? Oh, absolutely. So continuous pulse oximetry is, a, is, a, is another vital sign. In fact, I had to narrow down the vital uh -huh. signs there uh, in this particular case to the four original ones so I could provide the translational science behind them. But typically when we measure vital signs, pulse oximetry is provided, oxygen satur saturation is provided. And uh -huh. there was actually a movement to add a fifth and a sixth vital sign, uh, a fifth being uh, uh, pain levels and a sixth being ga uh, gait or activity levels. Um, but th they haven't really caught adoption yet. But Yes, absolutely. There are apps, devices that help you do continuous pulse oximetry, track that pulse ox oximetry, and, and see variations in it. So is it to the point where a physician is actually using this information um, it, it, that they didn't request it, but, you know, patients are coming into the mm -hmm. office armed with, you know, all of this personal medical device information and and you know what's how are the physicians prepared to to receive right. and act on that it is you know the way the way it's done right now and i i uh, recently wrote an article on this personal article on it uh the only way to do it is bring in the data and present it to the physician but it's not practical to 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 or to expect the physician to review reams of of, of printouts in a 20-minute visit so it really typically is just uh deferred to what the patient reports uh, you know, these are the trends that I've seen. I, 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 I see some elevations here, et cetera. Or uh, looking quickly at the numbers and getting an average to, to get an assessment. You don't get, there's a lot of rich data there. And that is, that is one of the big challenges is how to present that data in, a, in an informational, in a, in, a, in a snackable format so that the person can immediately get an assessment of what's going on. So uh, what... What about anomalous data? So, so you're, you, you have a blood pressure monitor and it's differential between left and right thumb. And, and isn't that in part, if I'm recalling from anatomy, the heart is actually on one side of the chest, but there's some people who are mirror imaged. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so there's gotta be cases where there's just anomal, anomalous physiology and you'd come up with, I don't know what, you know what would happen in that case, but you'd have a funny blood pressure because the timing would be switched between left and right. No, absolutely. So, you know, it, it but generally what, yeah. you know, how do you look for the anomalies and deal with them? No. And, and usually, you know, when the device manufacturers are, are, are developing a new device, they, they will first go with normal physiology to get to, to, to increase the amount of, uh, you know, people they can capture. But then it's just a question of creating normative values for for people with these conditions. Right. Uh, I had a discussion recently about how we can actually use wearable data in uh, rare monogenetic disorders um, and, and uh, try to find digital biomarkers there. You know, there's no there's no set cohort that we can refer back to for this. So it's just a question of first taking the step of collecting that data longitudinally and then again, again, normalizing it to that individual and ident identifying variations. There was one more thing that I wanted to say about your question as to, you know, how much adoption has really happened? Really, there are some fields in the field of uh, electrocardiography, where we do uh, walking heart rate, heart rhythm measurements. There, there are devices that are, that have been used to, to detect uh, a, a dangerous heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation. The other one, the other field where, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, adoption of these sort of continual longitudinal measurements uh, or, or biometrics is, is, is the field of diabetes, where we have the ability to do continuous glucose monitoring. So those two have really uh, moved forward in adopting, but I think the, 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 uh, the, the longitudinal vital signs monitoring is still, is still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in your case study that you presented, you were, you were kind of talking about, you were looking at correlations between variables. And, and so, so, you know, is, so any one, you talked about any one, but what about really looking carefully at 
the correlations when you have elevated blood pressure and temperature or, you know, yeah. And, and, and how, but those are from different devices and how, how is that being handled to aggregate and then, you know, get mine new information from correlations or lack thereof. Yeah. And, and you know, there are multivital science patches devices, one device that measures multiple vital signs. Uh, the only, the only frontier that hasn't been uh, hit yet is blood pressure really, but they can measure PAT or, or pulse wave velocity and give you uh, an assessment on vascular stiffness or vascular health. So they, and, and like I said, typically none of these vital signs are measured in isolation. Most of them are measured together and are interdependent. And we see that we've known that, um, you know, when heart, heart rate and uh, blood pressure are, are, are very connected, uh, when temperature goes up, your heart rate also goes up to, 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 to send blood to, uh, to start clearing out end products of, of the, the immune system's response to any sort of foreign pathogen. And so it, it, they are interconnected and it is, it is, we are totally capable at this particular moment in time, have this data available to identify those associations with multiple vital signs uh, at the same time. And, and so what, I guess, what were the, you kind of had a slide up and it went by pretty fast. So what, what, what are the other, you know, variables and, and devices that, that are coming down the pike? I mean, you, you focused on four, we talked about oxygen, you know. Yeah. You know, so the other, the other, the obvious one where I would say wearables began, not digital medicine, but wearables began was really steps. So activity levels. Activity levels have devices that come through to measure gait. We have the ability to put sensors, uh, accelerometers on different parts of the body and recreate a 3D image of your movement such that we can um, identify uh, uh, seizures at night. Um, you know, so there are multiple ways. Uh, the, the point of making it simple and breaking it down first to the basic four vital signs is to understand the translational science and engineering behind them. But that applies to every single sensor capability that I that I showed on the on the slide of different sensors and their capabilities of getting all the way down to UV light exposure. So we can collect these these, these data and find associations. And and what you know what are I guess what are the regulatory issues? I, I, I mean you know one something I I was aware of and is you know like glucose sensors have been around for a while and insulin pumps have been around for a while, but it took forever before you could sort of link them up and have the insulin pump act on the glucose. And in, and in part, I think this is all a lot of regulatory issues. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, how, how is FDA or, well, who regulates it? And if it's FDA, how are they viewing this? Cause, cause you guys are moving really fast and the great benefit could happen, but are we mired in, a, are we quagmired? Yeah, no, so you're absolutely, absolutely right about, you know, it is the FDA that will regulate these devices if they're used for diagnostic purposes, right? And, and one, I'll, let's take the example of blood pressure. Uh, you know, blood pressure, we, we, we don't have a great way of regulating or standardizing continuous blood pressure measurements. We just don't. Uh, and and the reg, to get FDA approval for a device manufacturer that is not cuff-based, Right now, the, the, the FDA only required a measurement against uh, a cough pressure measurement in 80 individuals, 85 indi individuals, which is, is comparing apples to oranges. Now, there are some guideline bodies that have, have put out statements saying we need to update the standards for approval for these, uh, for these uh, um, novel devices that come down the pipeline. But it's a, it is a question of catch up. The, the good thing is you know, institutions like Scripps, uh, Scripps Research can bring different bodies together to create and, and promote these sort of guidelines. Yep, terrific. Well, listen, Jay, there's a, a veritable avalanche of, of questions. Uh, and I, th I think we're gonna have to draw to a close, but I, I'll tell everybody that has typed in questions, we're giving Jay the transcript and, and you know, hopefully he can, he can respond uh, to some of the, these questions uh, post hoc. Uh, the recording will be available. Um, you can find it on the front row webpage, uh, maybe in a day or two after, uh, after they get the video up. Uh, and I want to remind everyone that the next front row is Mike Ballong, who's on June 29th, uh, talking about finding regenerative medicines. So Jay, uh, fantastic talk. Thanks so much for, you know, bringing us kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Uh, really, really impressed with what you're doing and, and what you've brought to Scripps. Thank you so much. 
uh, and everyone else, I'll see you at the next front row. Thank you.